Hello there guys, what is going on? Daniel Childs back here again. Another hotel backdrop, this time in Adelaide. We're here for the final uh, England group game against China Tuesday evening local time. And then if England avoid defeat, basically, they top Group D and we're very likely heading back to Brisbane for the round of 16, the knockout stages, and we'll see how far England can go. But um, as I've been doing, uh, just because of time constraints, work commitments and all that, whilst I've been out here in Australia, kind of cramming a lot of stuff into one show, basically. So in today's show, we're going to talk about the Fulham game, the pros of that, and then also transfer staff, Chelsea signing another centre-back, central midfield, and then kind of just are we excited? Are we optimistic? Should we be optimistic about the season ahead? So let's start off with Fulham. It was uh, Monday morning, a very early morning, I think like 1am here in Australia when it kicked off. So I, I didn't stay up for it. I woke up and instantly started watching it. And it was a great thing to wake up to and to get into my Monday morning because it was another brilliant performance, I think. I, I think it was... Um, a much more controlled one or maybe as kind of basketball in, in nature as kind of the Brighton one but I think there were a lot of things to be positive about and just the consistency I think of, of performance so far in pre-season has just been the most encouraging thing the fact that we've seen consistent things throughout the game I think mainly intensity of the players the way they're able to move the ball so quickly uh, but then also really you know keep intensity levels going and see certain players really relishing the opportunity under Pochettino. Performance levels wise, I think that Thiago Silva really put down a marker, not only the fact that he scored and also I think Ben Chir will probably be our main penalty kick taker because he, um, not penalty kick, sorry, corner kick taker because he um, he's a little bit underrated in that and when he gets them right, I think that's a really, really good uh, delivery and, and great header to, to get things off. But maybe just Silva putting down a marker that just because we've got all these young centre backs that we're continuing to sign, um, he is still there and he's still going to be laying down a marker that he's going to be a regular starter under Pochettino. And I think in Kunku for the second goal, just another great example of his goal scoring instincts. I think this is something that Chelsea have just greatly lacked. The fact that you've got a player there who just looked hungry to score that goal and was um, knew where the ball was going to land. And again, these are very, these can feel like quite simple things, right? But it, it's things that Chelsea have just greatly lacked is... I don't think Akai Havertz is scoring that goal. I just don't. I, I Because I think there are too many opportunities where I would see, say, Kai Havertz or others in recent years just stand in the wrong place, just not anticipate a ball or rebound. Um, and I think that that's what Nkunku has showed us already in pre-season is he just is um, a natural goal scorer and he scored different types of goal. The one against Wrexham was, I guess, the classic Nkunku goal. You know, you're going around the goalkeeper, putting it into an empty net. The second one is a more instinctive finish. You know, someone kind of being a poacher, kind of standing in the right place and, and being inventive with the way he, he puts the one back in the net. This one was, again, just picking up the pieces. And I think he, he potentially could mop up a lot of goals this season based on that. I also felt that Carney Chukameka has maybe gone under the radar. His performances maybe haven't been as celebrated uh, out of the games but I think he um, his desire and, and ability to get a shot off there was was really impressive he looks like a very hungry player that is probably frustrated you know frustrated after last season the lack of game time he had and doesn't want to kind of be forgotten whilst you've got Sari Cassidy you've got Andre Santos you've got uh, Conor Gallagher you know I think he wants to lay down a marker that he isn't just going to spend another season which would be really detrimental to his career on the bench. So I, I, I like that as well. Um, I felt Melo Gusto impressed as well. He, he just looks really aggressive, you know, really gets out there, makes challenges quickly, but um, seems to be good one-on-one. -on -one. I think he, he doesn't look like he can be beaten easily. So he seems to judge situations quite well. Just looks like a really competent player. And I think that's a, a really, really good thing when you've got Reese James... Um, also back and, and fit so I, I'm really happy about that and sort of second half was was as we see with a lot of preseason games because I think Poch made about nine or ten subs basically half time it was just ridiculous right because apparently in this in this summer series a preseason tournament with friendlies you can only make like four subs at one time I mean I just I don't understand it so there was this fast score situation literally at the start of the second half when the ball was just kicked out instantly um why it had to be so, so then Chelsea could make a load of subs and it's just it makes no sense to me whatsoever 
um, that it just the small thing doesn't really matter, does it? But it just it made me laugh that you know why can't they just make all the subs at half time? But there we go, and naturally the rhythm of the game wasn't as as fluid as then. But I did think Nicholas Jackson again showed some really good moments. I think there was one in particular where he ran down the left flank and was cutting onto his right. There's just something, and we've seen this in, in several moments, apart from the goals from Jackson so far, there just seems to be an inevitability about him. There seems to be a unrelenting nature that when he gets going, it's very, very hard to stop him. And I think that's really, really impressive. Um, the fact that he's able to really drive his team forward when maybe situations don't look that promising from attack. And that's also something you need. You don't just, it's not just about having, you know, very, um, good ideas and planned ideas of how you're going to move the ball forward, how a player is going to interact in the final third. But you do need a bit of invention at times. And I think that's one of the things that Jackson has impressed me. And the silverware, seeing um, Reese James with the armband, with the trophy, I think was really, really encouraging. It just looks very natural. And I think a lot of people are pushing for him to be captain. And I understand why. So there we go. Penultimate game. Uh, we've got Borussia Dortmund now. And then it's the Liverpool one. So we'll see how that goes. Let's move on to transfers. So uh, I think it was when the game was taking place. Obviously, by the time I watched the game in terms of, you know, after it was done, this has already come out um, in terms of Axel uh, de Sassi, the Monaco defender that apparently Chelsea have reached an agreement to sign. Uh, this is from David Ornstein in The Athletic who broke the story. Um, here it's telling me 1.35 in the morning here. So this is pretty much when it kicked off. And apparently Chelsea are paying around 45 million euros for the 25-year-old France international, who's a right centre-back. And kind of being referenced here, Wesley Fofana out injured for the rest of the season. We heard many rumours once uh, the Fofana injury came to light that Chelsea may be looking. And Pochettino said as much, Fofana is injured, so it's obvious that maybe we need to reinforce this area. It's clear, so Chelsea have gone out there, £38 million apparently, to get the deal done. Uh, Dezassi apparently... Um, only moved uh, to Monaco from Rem in 2020 for 30 million euros. So profit there for Monaco once again. He also was involved with France at the 2022 World Cup and, and made free appearances during the tournament as well. So it, it comes from a, a club where Chelsea have done pretty good business recently. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if a certain Lawrence Stewart is involved with the business that's been done here because um, obviously his track record there but and and as much as people who know French football well have, have spoken about this player's talent his his ability already um 25 years old so he's a little bit older actually than the bracket of players we've been signing in recent years and has the link to Benoit Badiashvili those two have played together as well but i think like a lot of people my kind of instant reaction was is this really necessary despite the injury injury to Wesley Fofana despite the fact that we're waiting for Badish Shield to return. And yes, Trevor Chalabar in the second half did go down with an injury. We've seen Bashir Humphreys, I think, have a really, really good preseason. Um, it's been great to see Pochettino really give him opportunity after opportunity. And it's hard to say that he has looked abject or out of place. He's looked very composed. He was with Thiago Silva in the game against Fulham and, and you know, didn't look wildly out of place. And I said, you know, in recent videos, if... You maybe don't need to sign someone else. Maybe you could just promote uh, Humphreys. Um, but Chelsea clearly feel differently. And I guess, number one, I think my problem with it is because it's not in the key area that Chelsea clearly need reinforcement. You know, defensive midfield, it's not a new goalkeeper. So there's that problem. But then also it's the lack of European football. My only logic to it is is looking at it and going, OK, we sign Axel de Zassi. He's a little bit older than the ones we already have. But then also... This is likely going to be Thiago Silva's final season at Chelsea. He moves on. And then hopefully by the time we get to next summer, Chelsea have European football again of some sort. So then you're going to need a bigger squad. That's the, the logic. But I do, I do think that also on this, it's when you're signing a lot of players who are of an age that need football and you've only got two spots available basically, I wonder how that's going to work out and I wonder how what the collateral damage is going to be because uh, a Trevor Chalabar instantly comes to mind here in terms of the amount of links for him, Levi Colwell too. I know he's a right-sided option, uh, but Benoit Badesho is a left-sided option too, so those two are competing. They clearly want depth, right, and that's what you're getting. Um, 
but to have five centre backs, um, I don't know. I just, I just wonder how it's all going to play out, and I wonder if it's going to go as well as and as smoothly as people anticipate. But as we saw Benoit Badia's shield, if it brings in a quality defender that adds a competent option for Chelsea, then none of us are really going to be complaining. I just it just doesn't fill me with much enthusiasm. I'm not sort of sitting there and going, yeah, this is the piece of business that needed to be done. It just, it's kind of like, really? Like, but they got it done swiftly and, and hopefully in a year's time, we're all sat here going, what a great piece of business. But I, I don't think it's going to be a, a game changer for Chelsea, at least in my opinion right now. But I, I do wish the best uh, for Dezassi if, if it all goes through and we sign him. The other one, um, to speak about is a, is a player that, again, not many of us know. And this is Leslie Hugo Chukwu. I hope I pronounced his second name right, who is, a, again, a French player, French-born um, centre midfielder, who was born in 2004, um, playing for Rennes in, in Liga. And I do want to reference uh, Seb C on Twitter. I'm sure a lot of you know him. He knows a lot about French football and has done a really, really good deep dive on his sub stack about this. So I will link this. I think this is the best place to go because I can't give you much insight on the player other than you know having conversations with Seb or just reading about him myself. And again, it's not the player that, in some ways you look at the profile of the player and maybe he could feel what Chelsea would want in central midfield, defensive midfield, in um, the fact that he could play centre back as well. But there is talk of him maybe going on loan to Strasbourg. Is he really ready to, to jump into Premier League first team football? You would like to think that we could have someone of a, of a defensive ilk with some sort of defensive capabilities, even if he is an eight defensive midfielder, but he could offer something that could be developed under Mauricio Pochettino um, with the Casado thing looking a little bit dead. But I, I'm not sure we will see. I want to see how this develops because he could be someone that very much just goes on loan. And Chelsea are looking at someone else other than Cotedo. Um, but it's uh, it's I do want to make this point. I, I do think I understand the logic, and people have made this right in terms of like say an Aurelian Chumeni who Chelsea failed to buy when they should have for like 35 to 40 million in 2020 or 2021. And then once you don't do that, their price goes out of you know, it, it's not that it goes out of kind of where you'd pay it because Chelsea clearly can pay over 100 million for certain players, but they they bump up to a ridiculous level quite quickly and the logic is when you're buying some of these players you are hoping that you are buying them at a, a reasonable fee and then in a few years time they are of that kind of 100 million bracket level that's the dream right but it's weird to me because when we talk about that for certain clubs we are talking about a brian in recent years we talked about it for a leicester um when you look at a monaco when you look at uh, borussia dortmund at a much higher level those clubs who, sure at times, can compete for major honours, but are not seen as like the elite, elite or the dominant clubs, like, like always top of the food chain. And it's weird to me that you're having this kind of balance of Chelsea going in that kind of direction, looking to sign young players for a smaller fee with the hope of them developing into greater players. But then Chelsea wouldn't want it to go to the second part where they, you're then losing those players as they head into their prime years to someone else, to someone who would be deemed higher up the food chain. I think that's the the interesting kind of maybe friction here because I'm pretty sure the new ownership wants to see Chelsea at the top of the food chain. They want to see Chelsea winning Premier League titles, winning Champions League titles, feeling like one of the the big English clubs, which I think we are. But it's just, it's interesting to see how that dynamic is going to work because usually that strategy is what you'd call smaller clubs or clubs with with less resources have to go by to to compete right and to, and to make ends meet at the end of the day and, and Chelsea are seen as a slightly different it's not that I'm against the idea I, I I like the idea of of having a coach like Pochettino and giving him a set of, of young players that he can really mold and develop into his image and hopefully really grow into great players but uh, how that works in the long term from the club strategy I think is something that quite clearly people are a little bit doubtful of to see how it all shapes up right after a, a challenging first year so we have one more preseason friendly Dortmund I think again really really good competition um, I think that in terms of the preseason I think it's been a success even if that Dortmund game doesn't go smoothly and we lose it whatever it doesn't you know it the performance isn't that good I still think this has been a success of a pre-season in terms of on the pitch I think Chelsea look like a Pochettino team they look ready for the season they look intense they look able to to play the ball quickly and all right there are areas of clear need whether that is goalkeeper trusting Kepa for another season feels like a, a flawed strategy 
um, absolutely no defensive midfielder, no kind of player that's going to be able to cover for others. That, that in itself is a massive concern over the course of a 38-game season. But then you, you flip that and you say, look at the attack, look at the fact that we have bought Nicholas Jackson, a player that many people shrug their shoulders at and, and looks like a bit of a steal. When you look at the fact that um, who United, uh, Rasmus Holland, who they've just signed um, you know, for a massive fee and a bigger fee than Nicholas Jackson, and he's going to come in with a lot of hype and a lot of expectation. Something that Jackson, I think, maybe is benefiting off of right now, the fact that he doesn't have that massive price on his head you know he isn't he wasn't seen as the savior player and I think maybe himself will, will benefit from that this season or Christopher Nkunku you know our, our kind of concerns about him adapting to Chelsea and how quickly he is showing things that he showed at RB Leipzig I think is just is just a quality thing to see and it's really encouraging so you know me, I'm more on the positive side. I try to be more optimistic. Um, it's not you, you be, you know, blind faith and you never criticise. There are things I'm concerned about. But at the end of the day, I, I think my kind of bare minimum requirement for Chelsea this season was enjoyment and just feeling like I'm watching a football team again that, that can actually function properly. And at the current moment, from all we can see right now, I, I, th I think you've got to be more optimistic about it. The serious stuff will begin and Chelsea will very likely come up with tests and they will have setbacks. That's that's the nature of it. And we have a very young group of players, much younger than last year. Um, I'd like to think that fans will see hopefully positives and feel like like in 1920, in, in, a, in a way we'll see that there is a a feeling that we can move forward with these group of players. And even if there are setbacks, there is there is reason to be, to be hopeful. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. It really uh, be of great help to me if you can go on to our women's football reach women's football on tiktok on twitter instagram and follow that's basically where all my work out in australia is going so it really mean well to me if you can go and subscribe or follow uh, and share that content because um, it's been really cool being out here speaking to england fans speaking to usa fans speaking to haiti fans speaking to dutch fans about the world cup so far more content coming up uh, for the rest of the tournament on there and i will see you again very soon you can follow me on twitter or x or whatever it's called right now